Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. Hey, you look pretty natty. You hadn't do a senior prom or something there? You got a, yeah, got this a is, coat and tie on. I decided we should join in the new trend in business, Bob, which is premiumization. Premium? I haven't heard about that. Why don't you it, share? That this is us? you take an ordinary product, mm -hmm. like you say, say, Cafe Bustelo, a very good product, great coffee, mm -hmm. and you bring out a premium version mm -hmm. and you charge more for it because it's premium, Bob. It's premium. Are we and looking at premium Mickey right before our eyes? You're looking at premium Mickey and you charge more and you take advantage of uh, the affluent share of the market. Okay. Uh -huh. And you fuck the poor share of the market. You sort of abandon them, except always, it seems, the premium version is actually no better than the ordinary version. In fact, in Cafe Bustelo, it's worse than the ordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we can con our viewers similarly by promising a premium version, charging them more, taking advantage of our high-income viewers, and, yeah. and just cheating, cheating them, providing the same old crap we always provide, you know? So that's, that's that's a stroke of genius. It's my business plan, and I wear a tie, so it's premium. Now, are you trying to move them from the $5 Patreon tier to the 8 or are you just trying to move them? Or Are we starting a whole new tier? We need what? a whole new tier, Bob, the premium tier. I have I have a friend who who was in the ad business in Hong Kong and they had like a product they were trying to sell uh -huh. and they could they couldn't for the life of them figure out what the slogan was to sell it mm -hmm. and then they finally hit on the slogan is premium it's premium yeah, yeah, so that's good that's our slogan um, so that gives us an edge over pretty much all podcasters I, I I'm not aware of a premium podcast out there Mickey I don't think so. There's been a, if anything, that, you know, the podcasts are getting cheesier. Yeah. Like, uh, like, I won't Mark name Hal names. Oh, go ahead. Name a name. I, I'm thinking of Mark Halpern's newsletter, which begins with a sort of begging for money and then goes into more begging for money. And then he finally gets around to the podcast. Well, he's kind of a special case. He was completely canceled and disgraced, right? True. Whereas we've only been disgraced. So that's different from us. I, I tried to cancel myself last week in a podcast with Ann Coulter. How did I that failed. go? What'd you well, say? It, or should you not say it on a respectable podcast? Like no, this? we can say it. There is, there is, there is a story in a tablet magazine about how Jews are disappearing on college, a lot of college campuses. They're, uh, like they're vanishing. Like you're looking at them and suddenly they're no, not there. No, oh. like their the admissions rate is their half is half what they used to be. Oh. Uh, it, some of them it's not true, but, but, but a lot of them it is. And the, the guy argued that they were disappearing even in Hollywood and everywhere else. But, um, but, but apparently, if you go to college professors and ask them why are the Jews, why are there so few Jews? I mean, they're still more than the population, but they're few compared with the way they used to be. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the answer is uh, ethnic preferences and other legacies and other things have crowded them out. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, they will say the Jews aren't what they used to be. Oh, so, they like, won't say that. Supposedly, t people have heard two of them actually say that. I think one of them was a joke. Anyway, so they're well, running. Was the person who said a Jewish? One of them. Both of them were. The point is wow. that they're, they've, they're they've become. Joking. The point is they've become so terrified of their woke masters that they'll excuse. Uh, they won't fight back. They will rationalize it. Uh, that that was the interpretation given by the person who told me. Anyway. Mm -hmm. So our, late, our our theme of the podcast was the Jews aren't, ain't what they used to be. And I uh, thought that, that would get... That's your I, theme. I'm not really signing... Oh, oh, of, oh of yours and Anne's? Yeah, fine. Yeah, I thought, that, yeah. I thought that would get us canceled, but nobody seems to have noticed. Now, that's, that's small potatoes uh, by today's standards. Perhaps because it was actually pointing to a real phenomenon. Uh, anyway. So what's happening in the world, Mickey? We have a budget. From Biden, no, we have, anyway. a, we have a budget that's never going to become the budget, right? This is just like this fictional thing right, that the president puts out. Nobody expects it to happen. Well, but it's a political statement, and it involves a certain amount of semi-interesting political gamesmanship. I was uh, delighted to see that it involves, and this is the only thing I know about it, taxes on upper-income people. It's got a lot of taxes. It, it follows the Obama model, which is you, you, you do four or five different taxes in the hope that the rich won't add them up and uh, and figure out that they're getting hosed. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, 
so it, 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 there are quite a bit of uh, soaking the rich going on. Uh, a couple things about it. One is uh, the, Biden is trying to, you know, I, I was saying Republicans should say, uh, show us your plan, Biden, and not venture a plan to save Social Security and Medicare because it's a trap for them because they then they'll wind up cutting benefits and they'll get hit over the head with it in the campaign. So they should just challenge Biden, show us your plan. Well, well you go first. Mm -hmm. uh, try, just go ahead, try to show us a plan that saves Social Security and Medicare uh, without raising taxes on anybody under 400000 and without cutting benefits. Well, it looked at first like Biden had done it. But just by raising a shitload of taxes on the rich, he had managed to, he claims, make Medicare solvent through 2050 uh, without you know, lower it without, without cutting benefits. And even there's this perverse thing where the payroll tax would be operative up to 160 and then this then be no more payroll taxes until you got to 400 and then you start paying solely because uh, Biden had promised no taxes for people under 400. So you'd lose that whole chunk of payroll tax from 160 to 400. Well, that just makes it of in effect kind of a regressive tax, right? I mean, well, the I'm payroll tax is a regressive tax. Yeah, but it makes it more. more so. It's more regressive than it. It's more regressive than it would be if they taxed it all the way through because yeah. the one sixty to four hundred, which is the vast bulk of the affluent, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, they get scot free. But it, anyway, so so everybody's saying Biden has closed the trap. Now the Republicans are on the spot. They have to come up with their plan, but not really. Mainly because it doesn't solve Social Security. It only solves Medicare. So it doesn't do anything to 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 uh, preserve Social Security for eternity. Uh, so the Republicans can just say, you didn't do the job. You didn't say Social Security. Try again. Well, how long uh, is Social Security good for under the Biden plan? I'm just thinking about it, my own life. I, think, I, don't, I, don't th I don't think it changes. I don't think it changes the the date uh, at which it only covers 80 percent of benefits. Mm. I think it's in like 10 years or something. I don't know. It's it's. Uh, it's a little later than the Medicare date. Um, but the wait other a second. How much of this, you know, I personally think none of this matters in electoral terms. I really do. But my, my, I mean, no, you, you, like you're the only person thinking about in all of America right now, you and 50 other people who tweet and write columns and shit are the only people thinking about this. But so I think it doesn't matter in political terms. And correct me if I'm wrong, like it doesn't matter in real terms, right? I mean, Biden's it, budget doesn't matter in real terms. Does anything that the Republicans are saying matter in real terms? It, it matters if Republicans get hammered on Social Security and Medicare again, like they have in the last no, few I, elections. No, that's the political. I'm asking about the real, like something becoming a law. Uh, some of this might become a law because they have this budget showdown and they might pass some of it. More likely they'll punt on all of it. But no, it's mainly political theater, but politics matters. It matters yeah, who wins the I next election. I don't think this does. I don't think this does. It just washes over people. They say, I, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 because okay. it's like, what? They're going to accuse Biden of not saving Social Security, and he's going to accuse them. And that's as far as most Americans follow it. It's these right, but if, accusations, and that's it. But if they take the bait and actually propose a cut in benefits, then, they're, then they get hammered. So... That's, okay, well, that's, that's what that passes happens. for that's what passes for reality in Washington, Bob. Um, the uh, and of course the point the point my perennial point is we you know he's taxing the rich in theory almost to the hilt. I mean, who knows how much you could tax the rich? But there's a, there's this famous quote from Kennedy's head of the IRS: "One for you and one for me." So fifty fifty. Okay. I think a, a, a mar an effective marginal rate of about 50% is about all you're going to get from the rich before they start absconding and and spending all their time finding shelters. And, and they're, way, uh, they're way below that now, right? Uh, I mean, on paper, the highest rate is what? Like, I don't know, 30 The highest rate of capital gains in California oh, will, capital be six, gains. will be 60%. Oh, oh, okay? oh, at the, at the and state it's level? A yeah, and the federal uh, top mm -hmm. rate is 42%. Mm. even before these add-ons. So if you add on a couple more, you're at 50%. I'm uh, confused, but I don't want to pursue the confusion here. It, it, 
Even I don't find my confusion interesting. There's like so. a, it raises it from 37 to 39, and then there's an Obamacare tax that raises it to 42. So if you're if you're if you're really rich, well, your marginal quick, rate is is approach asymptotically approaching 50 at the federal level, even before state. Wait, just a quick question about my confusion. I'm sorry. I know nobody yeah. else cares, and even I don't. But I had thought that uh, people on the left said capital gains should be taxed as high as regular income is taxed. And the rates you're quoting for capital gains taxes are higher than regular income. I don't understand that either. I don't understand <laughs> okay. that either. Okay, that's a okay. point of confusion. It seems to me, the, 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 you know, the old Mike Kinsley point, be like Germany, capital gains, same as income, no funny business. Don't go, sh don't go searching for shelters to turn regular income into capital gains. Mm -hmm. You're not going to win. That's the way to go. I don't know if this does that. I think this may, as you say, increase capital gains even okay. above income. The, but my point is, you don't just need to save Social Security. You need to also provide to extend health care to everybody, which is going to cost even more. So it's not enough to tax the rich to the hilt to save Social Security because then you can't tax them anymore to provide national health insurance. So the, Dem you know, it's a, it, it, the, the Democrats are shooting all their guns off and they're not even achieving their main goal. Plus the Biden budget includes all the build back better stuff that didn't get through Congress, like a daycare plan that's badly drawn, a, a preschool plan that tested terribly in the recent, the most recent studies, a uh, parental leave plan, a child tax credit, Bob, that's going to recreate the welfare system. Uh, and it, if you got rid of all those things, think of all the deficit reduction or national health insurance you could buy. I mean, what's more important? Uh, uh, pay, you know, subsidizing a, a, a government regulated child care system or a national health care system. Like there's no there's, it's no comparison, I think. So he doesn't do that. Uh, the final point is the tax on the rich are so great that my friends who are just sort of normal, normal, rich uh, people, normal, high powered lawyer people think they have to make $500,000 to even barely live in New York. Oh. And when you and and when you break it down or watch uh -huh. when you break it down if you if you start off making 500 you give half your income to taxes so you're really only earning 250 and you're sending a kid to private school they have a case. It's not That's insane. That's sad. That's sad. You know, I didn't realize America was in such bad shape. But that is how they feel. And That's they sad. feel in part because of the the extreme, the, sorry, the large tax cut. And if they, the taxes didn't take large tax bite, yeah. and the taxes didn't take such a bite, they could get by on two hundred and fifty thousand. We wouldn't have these people running around with these astronomical incomes, which I think has a bad effect on social equality. Just, just the number, just the number being so high. People, you know, making five hundred, and, and and here I am making thirty. What do I think, right? Mickey, I'm only one person. I can only do so much. But I just want to say, if any of your friends need counseling, consolation, I'm here 24-7. Because I'm telling you, this hurts me as much as them. My my friend, I have a friend who convinced me that 500000 wasn't enough to have a minimum decent upper class income. That's if what you I mean. If you Tell only allowed yourself. To call me. Tell if that you friend only, to call no, me. No, if you only allowed yourself two suits. Yeah. You're only allowed two suits in that budget. No, that's the first thing I thought of. You said were, this friend were, of mine making half a million, and I thought, God, you probably can't afford three suits. Actually, the she's a woman. The hotline is open for Mickey's she's a, friends. She's a woman who marries people who make half a million. Oh, in that case. <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, but, come on. But a very smart woman. The but, uh, I feel the sympathy leaking out of my body right now. I mean, if you're knows, not working for that half a million, the hotline's not open, folks. Oh, she's she's working. <laughs> Name Don't, names, name names. No. But anyway, okay, Mickey, uh, Mickey, I enough, just, enough I, about your about your rich friends and all this fake shit that doesn't matter. Enough. Okay, okay. Bob, have I made my point? <laughs> I can't help it if I move in a world of extravagance and grace. You really do. I mean, if, if people only knew. I mean, look at look at this. Look at this. I know. Look. This is a I, typical day with Mickey. This is he always looks like this. Actually, this shirt, bizarrely, is an attempt from L.L. Bean to go premium, a failed attempt to, to, to establish right. the L.L. Bean collection, which is the same old L.L. Bean shirt, except they try to make it thicker or something. 
It was a disaster. Anyway, hmm. the, the buttons don't even fit in the buttonhole. Man. Anyway. That, that's, uh, uh, well, you also can call my hotline, Mickey. That's sad. Don't call. So, uh, your hotline's going to be busy. You're never going to have time to write your book. I am here to serve. I am <laughs> here to serve, Mickey. God put me on this planet for a reason, and it is to console people who make half a million dollars a year. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, you know, if we actually successfully did that, we could get a nice revenue stream. What? Sir, counseling people who make five? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have a special tier for them, special sympathy tier in the parrot room. Um, so look, can we talk about other stuff? Yeah, we Biden. got a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah, we sure do. You want to talk about we have Biden, Fetterman, Ukraine, DeSantis, new big piece on poverty that's probably bullshit. Uh, I came, I came up with major two. scientific advances. JD Vance growing in office. Mm. Got a lot of um, stuff. you go first. Okay, uh, this could turn out to be a segue to Ukraine, could well. Uh, I'm going to start out with just a new reason that Biden shouldn't run for president, shouldn't be on the Democratic ticket, and a new reason that he shouldn't be president, okay? These are just things like I thought about. Now, the, th the thing about, well, first of all, the, the not, that he shouldn't be president is I was just reflecting, uh, you know, there was this thing uh this week that we could talk about either here in the pair room, but you know, Chi uh, Xi Jinping said this thing. Uh, the quote was Western countries led by the U S have implemented all around containment, encirclement and suppression against us, bringing unprecedentedly severe challenges to our country's development. Uh, people made kind of a fuss over it, noted that it was uh, more directly critical than he had been. And some people freaked out. Laura Ingram said, Oh, he hates America. Uh, I personally would say, uh, from his point of view, it's not a crazy way to look at it. We do seem to be declaring war on their uh, tech sector. It's like if somebody did this to us, we'd completely freak out. Um, within only the last few weeks, we've announced a bunch of shit on Taiwan. We're tripling the number of American troops there, training training their soldiers and sending them another $600 million in arms. We're, do we're doing a lot of stuff that, that, of course, from his point of view, um, is, is uh, quite annoying. Uh, and, and then, but this also got, uh, and I think we should pay heed to this. It, it reminds me very much of the speech that Putin delivered in 2007 at the Munich Security Conference. And I've got a piece about this in, in, in today's. Uh, it reminds me of the event. attitude of Japan before they launched Pearl Harbor. Well, you know who said that is, uh, you know, no opinion is the Twitter handle. Noah Smith said that exact same thing. He said, and, and I talk about that in today's non-zero newsletter. So it reminds me of Japan before World War II, Germany before World War One. Um, Apparently, if you if you read, is it who who is the 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 Johnson who writes the British historian, late British historian who writes conservative histories of the United States? Um, Somebody Johnson. If you read it, the the encirclement theory here in Japan could yeah. be the encirclement theories in Japan fears in Japan were planted by two Russian agents. That we're trying to go Japan into the war. Interesting well, but, footnote. Interesting but, there footnote. Were, but we did have the sanctions on their on their right. Oil. No, no, but 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 I they mean, were we goaded, were kind of strangled. They were goaded by Stalin's agents. Like it hadn't come to their attention right. that we were that we were depriving I don't know. them of precious resources. I don't know. I don't okay. know. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. Don't let me interrupt. Anyway, Putin gave a similar warning in 2007 at the Munich Security Conference. People kind of said, Oh, he's 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 nuts, or in one way or another, they dismissed it. Uh, he complained about NATO expansion, he complained about the U.S. Uh, attacking other countries, which at that point he had not done. And we said, screw you, and issued the invitation to Ukraine and Georgia. Within months, he was at war with Georgia and so on. We didn't listen. I recommend listening to this. But anyway, uh, to what she is saying now, but anyway, it, it led me to think about the, the totally gratuitous. I mean, I mean, these various things we're doing to China, you can argue about. There's there's arguments, you know, for them and against them and so on. I'm not saying there's not. I'm just saying we should at least go through the exercise of understanding how they look to China and what China might do in response, including arm Russia. I don't think they're there well, yet. But uh, what was gratuitous? Which part was gratuitous? Well, I'm getting to that. It, it, okay. It's it's the weird, uh, it's the weird thing Biden said in his State of the Union address. You you remember when he said, "What leader would uh, change trade places with Xi Jinping?" 
Name me one. Name me one. And you really have to watch the video to appreciate it. He looks unhinged. He starts screaming almost. It's it's it's. And of course, Xi Jinping hasn't said anything like that about him. No Chinese leader since Mao has probably said anything like that in Amer to an American leader. It's bizarre. And I just want to say, you know, it's completely gratuitous to score domestic political points. And it comes in the context of us demanding that China not arm Russia. And I'm here to tell you, if China decides to arm Russia, that's a game changer. You're talking swarms of drones and, and various other things. They have a huge industrial base, a lot of weapons. And <clears throat> this is my reason that, honestly, I'm sorry, I don't think Biden is qualified to uh, be but, president but, for but, another but, term. But what the uh, it, first, the statement uh, we talked about is, is nonsensical. There are a lot of people who, who would trade places with Xi, Xi Jinping. Uh, I mean, you know, he, he has he has some problems. Oh, but oh he's, yeah. No, I, would. I mean, he, yeah. I'm anyway, uh, I, I'd swap but, you for him, frankly. I, he'd be a great podcast with, guest. With with the tax rates on my millionaire's income. I mean, Jesus. Yeah. I'd go there in a minute. Yeah. But anyway, the point is, it's just like this is a delicate thing. I mean, we're try it's really critical that we keep China from harming Russia. And it's one thing to say, well, every one of these things he considers provocations down the line, and there's like a ton of them. We 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 we've levied new sanctions on China within the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's one thing to say, well, they're all just essential, which I'm pretty sure is bullshit. But anyway, this completely gratuitous personal attack is just it's deeply irresponsible. And you know, there's people dying in Ukraine. The whole country's getting wrecked. And Biden's fucking around like this. I, I'm not weird, kidding. He should not be president. It's weird because my, I, at first I was going to say, well, was it's all caused by the balloon. In other words, we were about to have a rapprochement with China and then the fucking balloon well, started did floating hurt. over. That did hurt. Uh, but obviously it's driven by dark, like larger forces underneath. Uh, the, uh, the, the CIA director, I believe it's the CIA director, Avril Haynes, I don't know what uh, she is. Bill she's, Burns is the CIA. She's the okay. director of national intelligence. Okay, government. right. Okay. She gave a testimony that seemed the U.S. has concluded that, that China has concluded it cannot achieve its national aims without hurting the U.S. So they are basically objectively our foe in a non-zero uh, sum conflict. Zero sum. Is, zero mean, sum. But, zero yeah. sum conflict. And uh, uh, non-non-zero sum conflict. And um, uh, and that sort of drives the uh, the that gives the impetus to imposing sanctions because we don't want them to develop our, their chip industry because they are going to use their chip industry to screw us over. Uh, and apparently, Biden's sanctions have been quite effective. There are ways around them, but Trump never imposed those sanctions. But Biden, well, he started it with Huawei and so right, on. But yeah, right, yeah. But anyway, uh, not that not that we shouldn't impose those sanctions. I'm sort of anti-China myself, but. Uh, but uh, that that is the that is the, the the tension underlying. It's not the balloon; it's that tension. So that was going to come to the fore anyway. And if China seems to be, they seem to have ha had some setbacks. So that leads to the paranoid encirclement theory. Uh, well, we should probably I, I, we should probably try to alleviate it. I of course disagree. Yeah, I of course disagree with the with the the assessment that it's overall a, a zero sum relationship, but. In any event, that's the one thing. The other, the, the reason I thought Democrats should think twice, well, another reason they should think twice about him being on the ticket is like when you look at the Ukraine war, I do want to talk about it a little, but it's like, if you imagine where's that going to be in November of 2024, it is more likely to be a political liability for Biden than a political asset. I could elaborate, but I, I would put money on that. And uh, and, and, and that suggests that the Democrats would be better off having a candidate who's just not directly responsible for it. And, and even a, if they've been generally supportive of Biden, it's still not the same as being the guy who called the shots. What if he what if he achieves a uh, a dirty deal peace settlement? Imagine and one it, that's going to look like a clear win for Biden. Look, you're not going to get uh, Russia out people, off of Ukrainian territory. We've people, been saying that's a, the definition. Do you think the peace. American people care who controls the Donbass? They just don't want they want the war to be over, so it's not a drain on our resources. It's not killing people, and they could talk about other things. Okay, but if you can't say, well, we taught Putin a lesson, and he really regrets this pretty convincingly, and and you maybe will make that argument, and 
in uh, in some ways. But if it's not kind of a straightforward argument to, for the average person, they're going to be listening to the Republican candidate if it is one of these kinds of candidates. And there are some who are saying this guy spent over 100 and by then it'll be 150 at least billion dollars. Got, uh, tons of people. And, and and I assume they'll pick up my line, which is he refused to negotiate in advance, decided it would be better to spend 150 billion of your tax dollars, get a ton of people killed, get the country of Ukraine destroyed and and leave Russia in possession of way more of Ukraine than they had before the fucking war started. Is, That's that, going to be the Republican argument. Isn't that what you would? Isn't that your argument? Yeah. Who would, be, I, who yeah, would be making I'm, who would be making that argument? Trump and DeSantis? Trump and DeSantis. Yes. Yeah. It's weird. Chris Christie took swipes at DeSantis this week for for his irresponsible doubts about the Ukraine war. And he sort of gave voice. To, he said, well, how do they teach foreign policy down there in Florida? Uh, it was sort of snooty. I wonder who, who does Christie think he's appealing to? It's is, in the is, electorate. Is there a chance he'll run? Yeah, he has nothing else to do. He's like he's like uh, Nikki Haley. Yeah. So he gets a lot of got a, gets a lot of publicity. He gets to go on a debate. Well, uh, honestly, and he drops out. I think he rightly figures that th this is an open lane in a certain sense. I mean, Trump and DeSantis and maybe some other people have the, you know, that part of the foreign policy thing locked down. There's no room in that lane. He might as well appeal to the neocons. And, you know, I think that's probably right. But it doesn't make it more doesn't make it make more sense. Anyway, I, I um. I just think you know that there, there's some there's some possible upside if 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 Zelensky is still in power and they have a deal. So what if Russia gets some territory? Uh, Biden will have proven that you know they will have proven that Russia's military isn't as mighty as the, as we thought it was. As Secretary Warner will be uh, sorry, Mark Warner will be happy that we've what did he say? We've crunched up their forces, chewed up. We've oh yeah, chewed up, we chewed up much of the Russian military. Uh, that well, was un yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, he basically he basically admitted, uh, yeah, this is a proxy war, and the Ukrainians are doing us a favor of quote chewing up the Russian military. You know, killing a ton. Of, in other words, killing a ton of Russians, getting a ton of Ukrainians killed. He was just delighted with it. Like he'd like to see it go on forever. It was bizarre. He's the responsible centrist Democrat uh, adult in the room. Supposedly, he? he's supposed to be. Yeah, well, I'm not in favor of his candidacy for for president. If that's a uh, prospect, uh, I think he, I think he, I think he lost my vote too. Rokana, folks, Rokana. I have two words for you, and I'll give them to um, you again. Rokana. Um. So, uh, let me. Can I just quickly talk about Ukraine? To, to do the yeah. the update. So last week, um, you know, I said Bakhmut seemed to be in the process of falling. Uh, it's kind of taken its time about it, but yeah, it is. It, it, uh, Ukraine has pulled back entirely uh, from the eastern part of the town. Uh, I said I thought you were going to see more and more criticism of the leadership for even leaving the troops there, where they where they still are in western Bakhmut. You have seen that even the uh, the Kiev uh, independent, which notwithstanding its name, uh, has been totally in line with the government. Uh, Ran ran some pieces that were that were implicitly quite critical. I mean, a repertorial piece uh, recounting a soldier's plight in Bakhmut, uh, and uh, and a number of people are saying this just at this point doesn't make sense. I kind of think maybe they're trapped at this point because they didn't get out soon enough. Uh, the the paved roads out of Bakhmut are portions of them are under quote fire control, as they say, which means that you travel them only at great peril. It's now the muddy season, so using something other than paved roads isn't that easy. Uh, and so I don't, I don't know if they uh, have much choice. Anyway, people are talking as if Bakhmut is now gone, even though, and the Russians are kind of bypassing it. But to the north and the south, they are now well to the west of Bakhmut. Now, uh, it doesn't. I was listening to to a Michael Kaufman. Uh, podcast today you know he's got a pretty good track record he says he doesn't think the russians are going to proceed uh west to the big enchiladas kramatorsk and uh, i think it's slavonsk um he thinks they're going to go north there's, there's towns up there and then hope to to get the big enchiladas later 
And he in general doesn't seem uh, I'm that impressed with 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 Russian progress. I mean, it is the case that ground in various places continues to change hands at a slow pace. It's almost always going into Russian hands. Um, and that's related to why I just don't see this being some kind of huge win uh, for for Biden. I mean, not you can only extrapolate so much. And, and what I'd like to see really is a debate between Michael Kaufman and Douglas McGregor. I mean, I, I listened to McGregor last night, Kaufman today. I don't know what to think. Uh, McGregor is always predicting great things for the Russian military. Um, his latest thing is, uh, I mean, like a month ago, he was acting as if by now we'd see more progress than we see. What, what he's saying now, and the factual basis of this is correct, the winter was a warm winter. So you didn't get the, the, the frozen ground uh, that's so solid that you can consistently go on offense uh, very readily. He's now saying, um, so wait till the end of the muddy season, and then the Russians uh, are going to do these great things. Uh, Kaufman doesn't seem convinced. He seems to be going with the conventional line that it was a mistake for the Russians to launch their offensive now. And this, you know, and and in, I don't know, two, three months or something, the Ukrainians will launch their offensive. They'll have more equipment in their hands and so on. They're, they're building up their troop strength. Um, so, I, I mean, we'll, we'll see. I, I don't know where exactly we're heading. I mean, I mean, Kaufman did a lot of it. Yeah, go ahead. Was Kaufman one of the people predicting that they were going to run out of ammunition and shells and things? And they haven't done that. They, there's an outfit called Euro Intelligence points out that the, the dire predictions that, uh, the Russia supply chain wouldn't hold up, uh, have not come to pass. No, that's true. Well, first of all, uh, I mean, he says there was a lull in Russian artillery fire during February, but then that that seems over. So they had a they seem to have had a temporary uh, problem. Now, that may have been around Bakhmut and may have had to do with uh, w whether the military felt like resupplying the, the Wagner group. Um, but uh, the uh, but but Ukraine faces an ammunition problem. There's been a lot of discussion of that. Uh, you know, we, the, the, the Europe and us combined are not making nearly enough artillery shells to keep them supplied uh, on a, you know, if that's the whole, the sole source of their supply, and we don't dig any, any more deeply into our own um, stockpiles. The other thing he said they have trouble with is, uh, th that's a challenge for Ukraine. I mean, their military is expanding now. They are mobilizing and they're getting ready for this big offensive. And to him, the for, their, for their big offensive. For their big offensive, uh, some questions whether they're going to have enough hardware to go with it. But he says they are they are building up these huh. these uh, big you know, uh, you know ample armed forces now. But he does say force reconstitution is a challenge. And I and I read uh, another thing that happened. Uh, I read elsewhere is uh, this week is Ukraine the government shut down a bunch of telegram channels because they were being used uh, for for draft evasion. I mean, I'd read about this for weeks uh, that that like the way it works is, you know, the these these the people drafting Ukraine, they're like tracking them down. Sometimes apparently they're even like there's a ruse where they'll order a pizza and the guy shows up to deliver it and they say you're in the army. <laughs> and, and and like so when they're like at a at, at a shopping mall or something tracking guys down, that will spread through these telegram channels. And and everybody who doesn't want to be in the army will stay away. So they shut down all these telegram channels, and that's another sign that uh, you know they're they're, they're having uh, trouble. I, I personally think you're not going to see great things from this offensive uh, just because defense is easier than offense when both sides uh, have a lot of newly mobilized people. But we'll see. How many people are they going to lose in uh, Bakhmut? Is that is, is is that the famous encirclement, entrapment that everybody feared about on the Eastern Front? Are they going to lose hundreds, tens of thousands of troops? I mean, how many are there? Uh, there aren't tens of thousands in Bakhmut. There are thousands, I think. Uh, you know, it, it's also sketchy. Uh, apparently, I mean, the Russians are not eager to do house to house fighting. That's why it, that this may stay unresolved, uh, even if it's kind of de facto encircled for uh, or quasi encircled for a long time. 
Uh, the Russians are starting to bomb it with actual planes. Uh, you know, there are residents there. Uh, there are people, you know, especially old people. I don't know, but the casualty situation in general, I've never seen something that's so hard to pin down on both sides. The estimates just all over the place. Douglas McGregor claims 200,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed. That's a super high end estimate. I mean, more, more mainstream is 200,000 casualties, which would imply like 40,000 right. killed or right. something. But uh, I, I, I can't. I have no idea. Both sides claim what there is near consensus on is that whatever the value may have been in hanging on to Bakhmut as long as Ukrainians did in terms of, you know, exchanging casualties with the Russians, in effect, you know, uh, the idea being that the, for a while the exchange rate was in favor of Ukraine, that, that's over and uh, no, no good is being served. Pretty much everyone seems to agree on that. Um, um, so. Well, I was gonna, um, I was gonna make the point uh, that you know maybe it doesn't you know we can do uh, what Ann Coulter calls the weekend at Bernie's move with Joe Biden because look at John Fetterman, he's in the hospital for depression. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an article in the New York Times attempting to prevent what what the what seemed to be the best put the best face on this it had a couple of points one he's he's getting better why he 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 shared some cookies with some nurses and he makes a lame joke when his chief of staff adam gentleson shows up in a plaid shirt he says i didn't know you were a farmer uh so that's a clear sign that he's on the road to recovery bob and then it makes the point he's not necessary anyway because the staff does all the work when you go to his office you meet with the staff the it's often true on the Hill that senators find themselves sponsoring bills only after they've been told by their chief of staff. <laughs> you know, it's oh. like the chief of staff commits them. So Adam Gentleson is now senator from Pennsylvania. If you want to get anything done, you talk to Adam Gentleson. And 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 Fetterman is he might as well be weekend at Bernie's. I don't think he is, but you know. They should turn all this stuff over to staff, just get rid of the senators. There used to be a joke in Washington, you know, like if a if a senator seemed really smart, they'd say he could be staff. You know, I, didn't, a, I didn't hear that one. Uh, I, you know, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's true, but he has to show up to vote, right? He has to show up to vote. That's the one thing he has to do. They should change uh, that law. Just uh, let but, his, uh, well, soon, you know, McConnell's probably in the same hospital with his concussion. Soon half the Senate will be at Walter Reed. They can just have him vote from the set up a separate just be able Senate to too. They should Over be able there. to specify voting interns. Just have an intern show up and go, yay, nay. Um, because that'd be a step beyond uh voting to outsource their legislative authority to Kenneth Feinberg. They will vote to outsource the vote to outsource to an intern. So an intern will vote to give their legislative authority to an agency. Okay. It'll be like Marbury versus Madison or something. Um, um, sounds good. Anyway, this, I, I recommend reading this Fetterman thing. I hope he recovers so we don't have to read any more of these. They're really depressing. Especially the jokes. I mean, the, the rule of journalism is anytime they say that Bob Wright is funny, why, here's an example of his humor. It's going to be really, even if Bob Wright is funny, it's going to be lame, okay? It's, it reminds so you add, me. <laughs> yeah. You add that to the fact that he probably is lame, and you get a really lame joke. But go ahead. It reminds, it reminds me. me of when we would hear about a new nickname, a clever nickname that George W. Bush had given somebody. You know, like, you know what his nickname for Putin was? Uh, no, I don't. Pooty Poot. That's a good one. Yeah, he was a clever guy. I'm, I'm really sorry that we had to see him go. Um, so, uh. So what else? Uh, the, Nord Stream, the, we got the Nord Stream uh, thing settled, Mickey. It turns out it was hobbyist I'm, saboteurs. I'm suspicious of that one, too. <laughs> if the U.S. had done it and Seymour Hersh had, had, had discovered it and blown the whistle on them, what would their next move be? They would be say, oh, we have intelligence that we didn't do it. They can't blame it on the Russians because that's really provocative and it's complete bullshit. But they can say, and they can't blame it on the Ukrainian government because that would be betraying an ally. But they can say that Ukrainian partisans who wanted to support Ukraine, did it. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it. That makes me doubt it then and there. And plus, 
you know, it's not an easy thing to do. You have to have a very sophisticated diving operation. It's not, it's not like, as you say, hobbyists just know how to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, you would think it might be Ukrainian resistance groups aided by the U.S. Navy or something. Uh, it, it's just, it, I, I would not take that report uh, at face value. Um, no, I was wondering. I mean, I kind of doubt they just 100 percent made this thing up. I was wondering if maybe what happened is Germany does have this ongoing investigation. They they found this clue, although I haven't heard of compelling evidence that this boat really was the boat. It's a boat that was in the vicinity. It was here. It was there. It's suspicious, I guess. I don't know how much more they have. But but one possibility is when they found out the people who uh rented it had some of them had ukrainian pa uh, passports the u.s government hastened to get out in front uh, in front of the story and say well that we were it probably wasn't the government and i will say on behalf of that claim look if it's true that this boat was involved which i uh, haven't seen any evidence of and it's true that there were these ukrainian passports um it does seem strange that it would be the Ukrainian government. I mean, surely they have the resources to get foreign passports, right? The Ukrainian government can get a hold of fake foreign passports, right? You would think. You would think. You would think any country can get a hold of fake foreign passports. I thought they I thought they tracked it down through traces of, of chemicals. No, so, well, maybe you're ahead of me. I I, I haven't no, I don't I haven't. know. Uh, but I I didn't know about well, that this would boat. be yeah. Well, I, know, but... I, I think we saw a picture of the boat today. It's a nice, oh, okay. it's like, uh, you know, the Gilligan boat. It's nice. Uh, a three hour, what was it? Cruise. A three hour cruise. Um, it's a nice little modest boat. I mean, it looks a little too modest, but. And that's enough to like blow up a uh, pipeline in three places? That seems. That was my question. It's like water skiing is one thing, but come on. Um. Anyway, I'm. I, I st I still don't believe that Biden is one of his first acts as president ordered the destruction of this pipeline. That's just way too ballsy for him. But uh, 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 I I'm mm, mm. he was awfully emphatic that don't worry we'll get it done right. Yeah. Plus I I I, I honestly think that look he's again as you may have heard he's uh, kind of elderly. Uh, some days perhaps not the most. Uh, powerful cognitive force on the planet and you know he's in the hands of of uh people who've known him a long time i mean i'm not far be it from me to accuse them of being puppet masters but these these are guys who are uh you know some of them have been his staffers forever and i'm sure if they uh want to push for something uh you know they they can probably get him to sign off uh i don't know i don't want to get too too conspiratorial but uh, and it's weird. Anyway, I, that, that was one of many stories I was suspicious of. Now, what about your friend Tucker Carlson? Did you see the uh, Jack Schaefer's takedown? It's not like it was a real challenge to do a takedown at this point. He's been exposed was, as a complete hypocrite, but go ahead. It, it was well done, and it had it had the, the uh, it, it came out and said, look, he's a phony. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess my take on Tucker having worked for him is uh, he's not a phony populist. I think he genuinely believes uh, in, in these uh, in a sort of Trump Trump like version of the Republican Party. Does he? Uh, yeah, it's not like he's not like he's not like he's a liberal playing a conservative. It's not like uh, he disagrees with the political views of his audience, but he is uh, lying about Trump, obviously consciously. Uh, and that you know that that's what those Fox people have to do, I guess. Uh, that is why, it, you know, there's a there, there was a big uh, a big fuss over Russell Brand's takedown of John Heilman on on Bill Maher, where he said MSNBC was just as bad as Fox. Hmm. And I do think Fox is a cut, at least one qualitative level, different than MSNBC. I mean, they're they 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 are much more like a a, ma a mafia organization. It was put to me by a friend. Uh, uh, Fox's audience tells Fox what to say. They're total slaves to their audience, mm. and and MSNBC tells its audience what to think, because uh, the MSNBC audience is a bunch of liberal sheep 
who need to have their talking points read to them. But the t- with Fox, the, the uh, audience, the audience reads the talking points to Tucker Carlson. So that's different. I mean, I'm not sure about that. I, I think MSNBC with Russiagate, for example, I think at a minimum, the causality was working in both directions. Uh, I, don't, I don't think the fans, the viewers needed a lot of encouragement to become convinced that the smoking gun was just around the corner and every night they'd tune in to see if they had found it. Uh, um, that's true. But but there were um, several non-smoking guns that were offered by MSNBC. I think that that everybody, all of a sudden, everybody I knew was talking about. And why were they suddenly talking about it? Because it was on cable. Um, well, yeah, but the reason they offered the smoking guns is because they knew that their fans uh, wanted that. Um, yeah. I mean, foreign policy is a little more is is a little more of a mystery. Although in the case of Russia and Ukraine, not so much. So that is to some extent uh, an extension of. Uh, I mean, first of all, look, Russia invaded Ukraine, so it's kind of an easy call in that way. But even beyond that, I think the MSNBC audience had been primed by Russia Gate to uh, hate Putin even more than they might. I mean, as as it's become agree with me TV, uh, but they've they've sort of converged into being the same sort of outfit. Uh, <laughs> It used to, you know, Fox goes around and before the before a show, they'll say, okay, we're not talking about this today, okay, mm-hmm. to the panel, okay? I don't know, that's, that never used to happen. Probably happens on MSNBC now. I bet it happened on Fox first. Um, mm. They, you know, Fox would remove a guest, never have them on again because Carl Rove would call up and complain about them. I'm but sure Obama complained about stuff, but I don't think they, you know, snapped too with the alacrity of Fox. That, that was uh, the sound of my alarm, which means that by virtue of our uh, prior agreement, we're supposed to sign off soon. I want to say um, quickly, I, on, the, on the weather, first of all, Jack Schaefer's piece is in Politico, good takedown of Tucker. Um, Tucker, you know, the disclosure of all these emails gave Jack a lot of material to work with. Must must have been hard to keep that piece short, but it is. Um, but uh, on on the fraud question, You'd know more than I would about how long Tucker has seemed like a fire-breathing populist, but I certainly remember a day when on foreign policy he wasn't singing the song he's singing now. He was as hawkish as anybody else on Iraq and was mocking people well into the uh, invasion and occupation, mocking people, or at least after the invasion, uh, mocking people who th- who said no weapons of mass destruction would be found. And that was um, 20 years ago. Well, I know, but I, but, but like, uh, I, well, you tell me what was his view on your issues then? Was he anti-immigration? And when and- I work, when I worked for him, he was pretty thoroughly populist, and he and and his publisher, who he disagreed with on immigration, but he was uh, on my side of immigration, and he he wrote very very well written essays uh, defending populism. Tucker so- was Tucker was on your side on immigration. Yeah, but the publisher was an immigrant and or diff- and when, was was on the business side of wanting more immigrants. So when he was disagreed. this? When was this? God, let's see. It was after I left Slade and after I was fired by Tina Brown. And wait, so, Tina Brown fired you? Well, she didn't renew my contract. Wait, when were you working for Tina Brown? I wasn't working for Tina Brown. I was working for Newsweek, and then Tina Brown took over Newsweek. And ended everybody's contracts. I had totally forgotten with. that part of her career. She was running Newsweek? Um, Tina Brown? Yes. Don't hmm. you remember he, he, uh, 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 Sidney Harmon? That was, uh, no, then it got sold to Sidney Harmon. Anyway, I, it's very complicated, but at some point she was running Newsweek and, hmm. you know, she, she completely fucked it up and turned it into a, you know, a mouthpiece for Hillary and, uh, and, uh, Gave, gave, you know, her big pieces were it, it, sort of disingenuous pieces she coaxed out of Harvey Weinstein. And mm. it's weird. It's like a waste of a great talent. She's a fabulously brilliant person and completely fucked it up. I saw her at a party just two days ago. Well, I did not, we I did not, I did not go to her up to her. I did not go up to her and say, you completely fucked it up. Now, that showed a lot of restraint and maturity, Mickey. I actually avoided her. Uh, assiduously. Mm-hmm. 
where she was not, seeking you not, out. Not, not that, she, that must have been that, hard. Must have been hard. Not that she ducking was, into hallways. <laughs> no, Tina, no. I'm not, sorry. Not that she was seeking me out. She was not seeking me out. She probably doesn't even know who I am. Um. Anyway, I, I'd like to know if you ever remember when it was that you worked for Tucker. I would, I would, I would bet. It's well, we can figure it out. It was sometime around uh, 2012. Okay, I would bet that even then, which is well after the Iraq War, he wasn't talking this restraint language on military force. I'll bet he wasn't. But uh, I, I, I don't remember much of that. It's, but probably military foreign policy would be the last. Yeah. Last place where he would come around to populism. Yeah. Okay, and I actually well, don't I actually don't know what he thinks about it, but I suspect he's pretty thoroughly in Trump's camp. It'll be interesting to see whether he goes for DeSantis, because obviously they obey orders there. So it's a question of what he's ordered to do. Is he ordered to be for DeSantis? Fox seems relatively pro DeSantis at the moment. They're anti they're certainly anti Trump when they can get away with it, which is rarely Mm -hmm. But they don't have Trump on when they don't have to have Trump on. So, but they haven't gone gung ho for DeSantis yet. Mm. Uh, well, um, it's, pretty, it's also pretty clear DeSantis is running. Everybody, everybody has decided that. Oh yeah, I assume. I assume. No, it's grim. I want to. I there, we should talk more about this in the parrot room. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that Trump really is going to be the guy. It, um, it's not grim that DeSantis is running. DeSantis is our only hope. What are you talking about? Uh, what do you mean, we white man? I mean, I, neither. Yeah, I don't. But if you want to, if you want to stop Trump, the Sanus is your best, the last best hope of mankind. I mean, even my liberal friends agree with that. Yeah, no, he he would probably be better than Trump, but that's not saying much of anything. So, uh, and I'm not, I I I don't want him to be president. So that that's but only. There's no really. comparison between him and Trump in terms of craziness. Now let's talk about this in the parrot room. Um, speaking of the parrot room at patreon.com slash parrot room, uh, anything else we're going to talk about? Well, the, um, now you, write, is, you remember your things. Okay. I'm not responsible for this. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, we can talk about January 6th. I don't have that much to say about it. If you want to talk about it, we can talk about it. Why? Is there something um, new about January 6th? Well, yeah. Tucker Carlson produced this, uh, five TV shows based on the, Eternal footage of uh, from inside the Capitol was given him by okay. Kevin McCarthy. You can explain that to me. Okay, but uh, uh, not that I have that much to say. Um, we have uh, uh, was we have was it uh, as bad for Gavin for Gavin Newsom to cut Walgreens out of state contracts because they don't carry a birth control drug as it was for Ron DeSantis uh, to. Uh, take away Disney's special governing privileges because they lobbied on the don't the so-called don't say gay bill. The answer is uh, 11, folks. People are talking about that. How annoying are these community notes on Twitter, which Judd Lagoon complained about, and I'm actually on his side. Uh, semaphore, troubled startup under fire. I've always wanted to say that. For it's... Uh, They've started a bunch of money, you know, uh, buck raking offices uh, mm -hmm. with China, mm -hmm. and they're under attack for they're under attack for the wrong reason. But we can talk about that. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, the SATs on the oh. way out is that a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, I mean, you sexy know, you, as hell. People, people. Uh, you have views money. of that. You have strong views of that. Yeah, no, everybody wants to hear about the SATs. You want to talk about Djokovic instead? Is that sex, sex here? Djokovic, the tennis player? Yeah. What did he do? They're not letting him into the country because he's not vaxxed. So oh, God. That he can't again? play a sub. Yeah. That's my reaction exactly. Uh, so wait, uh, he's not going to be. It's a while from the U.S. Open. You're talking about America? I'm talking about America. Yeah. I don't know. Well, if it's not well, the U.S. US Open, what, a long what way is, off. Well, what tournament is it then? I don't know. Uh, well, Wimbledon is before that, and the French is before that. I think the Australians probably already happened, and I don't know. Um, um and David so, Lindley, the great guitarist, died. I have a okay. Uh, uh I, I just want to say a few words, nothing much. 
I want to say a few words about Jimmy Carter, who apparently may be not with us for much longer. Um, lab leak. I, I I wrote a piece. Did you see my Washington Post piece, Mickey? Did you read it? Did you see it? Read no, it? I didn't even know you had a Washington oh, Post. Oh God, I was too busy partying with Dina Brown. Apparently, did she mention it? Did she mention my piece when you were trying to evade her? <laughs> <laughs> Come back, Mickey. I want to talk about Bob's piece. Um. The uh, anyway, it, it's a it's a it's a yeah, it's a take. It's a take. Uh, I promised I'd tell the pig joke. I'm going to I'm going to tell the pig joke this time. Maybe a little bit about the show Evil, which I'm just getting around to watching. And uh, I don't know. Stuff like that. Oh, Peter Thiel. Uh, I listened to a talk he gave uh, because there was a piece about it in Vox. And I want to I want to talk about that. Maybe you can convince me that. Uh, he's not this weird, incoherent guy. I can, maybe, maybe. Um, so anyway, all this, folks, and more, patreon.com slash fairroom. Also, Mickey, uh, you know, we should make an appeal to people. I mean, it's a, it's a lot after just now appealing to the, after, after just now annoying almost everyone who's listening to this because they're not patrons and they don't feel like becoming patrons. And we're talking about stuff they're not going to have access to to encourage yeah. people to smash the like button. But they should if they and want they're to. Not gonna, hmm? They're not. Gonna, they're not going to go for the premium, extra cost version. Bustelo, no bustelo, um, para uh, ti. Uh, no um, bustelo. No bustelo supremo. No, see. Si. Um. <laughs> so, uh, but but yeah, seriously, smash. You know, if you if you, uh, because it's a, it's a jungle out there. Have you noticed? Everyone is 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 starting a podcast. I noticed that about four years ago, Bob. Okay, it's still happening. And, <laughs> okay. and it's a jungle, and it's mano a mano combat, and it, it, people like us and aren't pissed at us at this point for mentioning all this premium content, want to hit the like button at YouTube? That really matters. It feeds the algorithm, brings brings new people, and, you know, helps with the churn, you know? Churn. Um. Is that bad uh, marketing to talk explicitly about churn? Uh, to say to people, you are part of the churn. To us, you're mere churn. <laughs> Is that good? Uh, I don't think so. It's like telling them they're going to be cannon fodder. <laughs> Man. Uh, so um, yeah, and also yeah, Ukraine maybe. I, I I I there's endless. I waste so much of my knowledge about and Ukraine. I can, I can always whine that my Twitter feed has been cut in half. That's a hearty brander. Yeah, I, I I got complaints about Twitter. I always have complaints about Twitter. We can maybe get to that. We'll see. Uh, so anyway, uh, I will see you there uh, uh, just about immediately.